<clears throat> Good morning, everybody. My name is John Peer. I, I go by the handle Peer uh, from Kalamazoo, Michigan. I've been geocaching for probably about nine months now. Um, so I figured I'd give this presentation, see how many people else out there knew about it, and uh, spread the word. So what is geocaching? It's basically kind of like an adult scavenger hunt. Uh, it's a game you basically find coordinates. I mean, people post caches out in the world. There's several million out there right now. And you post the coordinates, and then whoever is going to find it, you download the coordinates to either a GPS, your smartphone, which has, there's several apps out there for I'll talk to you about later, and you go find the cache. At the very lowest level, you're locating an object. Um, I have several different types up here. Uh, it'll probably be easier to see once we hit up case. Um, just different types of caches. Uh, and each one contains, at the very, very least, a log. So you're going, using these coordinates, finding the cache, sign the log, and then you record your find online. So, I mean, there's, there's different methodologies of, I mean, what you get out of it. Um, ultimately, in the, in the end, it's just like a game. And best of all, it's free outside of gas. All right, so why geocaching? Uh, this is what people get out of it. I mean, most people, it's a very family-friendly game for the most part. Um, there, there are different difficulties that children may encounter, um, especially with uh, terrain or um, just th they can be, well, I guess they could be underwater, they could be in swamps, random shit like that. Um, so, I mean, it, some people do it for the numbers. Uh, the number one person out there right now has over 51,915 finds, and that's over the course of probably about eight years. Myself, um, I cash under the name Team PV, and we only have, I mean, in nine months, we have about 360 fines. So it, it's it, what you put into it, what you get out of it. Um, I mean, ultimately, you're, you're walking through the woods finding fucking Tupperware. And that, it, that, it, it is, because, I mean, this is literally, it's called a lock and lock. It's a brand name. Watertight seal. Fucking Tupperware. So the the norm, these are the normal cache types, or these are the uh, I guess approved cache types on uh, the geocaching.com website. Traditional cache is just going to be some normal normal kind of container. I mean, all these I have up here are considered traditional. Um, multi cache is basically a staged cache. So you hit you find your first one, it gives you coordinates, you hit a second one, it can be any n number of stages. Letterbox is kind of a hybrid between what's called letterboxing, which is basically geocaching except there's stamps involved and you go, you take your personal stamp, you stamp their log, and you take their stamp and you stamp your own log. I haven't found the interest in that, but they've hybrided it to geocaching and you just sign their log now. Um, I mean, it, it contains the same type of things. Larger caches are going to have different trade items inside. Normally dollar store shit, stuff kids like. Nothing that's ever really interested me, per se. Event caches. I actually tried setting up an event cache for today. They denied me on two reasons. I didn't do it two weeks ahead of time. I did it two days ahead of time, because I only knew I was speaking on a Wednesday. And you got to pay 120 bucks to get in here. And they, they don't like pay for so their basis is free. So they denied that event cache. I did place a cache around the building here, um, which we'll get to later, and I'll give you the coordinates if you're interested in going to find it. Uh, it's not posted on the geocaching website right now, and I'm actually going to be moving it because of minor technical difficulties with its current location, but we'll deal with that later. Um, unknown caches are things like puzzles. Um, people will put out there different... I mean, ciphers, and they'll give you the end result, and you basically have to figure out which cipher to use. Um, different random puzzles like that. So it, you, you figure out, derive the coordinates from their puzzle, and then you have the coordinates to go find. Uh, Cito is cash in, trash out. It's kind of like a earth-friendly cache. I mean, it's, it's not really a find. You, it's a, kind of like an organized event where everybody comes around, picks up trash in a particularly... Um, dumpy part of location, I don't know. Earth caches are kind of like science-based caches. You go to a certain location, 
Um, and it, it takes a decent amount of work to build out an earth cache because you have to find a specific geological location, uh, be it water or certain environments. And it, it basically it's learning. And it teaches you about the cache and then you have to go there and d do certain, a certain list of things. Like I know some require you to test pH of the water there or calculate the rate of flow at a dam. Um, and lastly, where I go caches, they're, they're kind of like um, downloaded programs. You need a where I go player. Uh, they, I know they make them for Android. And some of them are games. Some of them are, I guess they're all basically games. Uh, but it requires you to do certain, certain events and hit different, uh, I guess, areas. One I know recently is, was, it's a, based out of Flint, Michigan, and it's a fast food cache. And he gives you a list of like six different um, fast food chain slogans. And it's within a three mile radius of Genesee Valley Mall in Flint. And you have to figure out, I mean, in a three mile radius around this mall, figure out which fast food restaurant, drive to that restaurant, go through the main entrance, and based on the GPS coordinates he has in there and whatever your phone is reporting, then it will mark that one as completed. You basically go through all the different six slogans. Once you complete that, it gives you a final GPS coordinate. Locate that coordinate, and then you have that cache logged. Sizes. Uh, they range from micro up to, well, I guess large and then other. Micro is basically a log only. There is actually, I guess, it would fall under other, and it's considered a nano. And they range about half an inch by a half an inch in size. Um, micros, these up here I have would be considered micros. All they contain is a log. Um, I mean, this one's just a key holder, magnetic key holder. Um, this I built out is just a plate cover, but on the back, I mean, it's, I have magnets in here, so I could literally magnetize this right to a light pole, and I mean, who would tell that's what it is? I mean, I've seen many of those. Uh, this one is just electrical pipe. Ideally, the log is right inside here, so you have to unscrew it to get to it. Uh, small caches, these would be considered small, my Tupperware. Um, containing a logbook like everything else. Inside there are other random pieces of trade uh, called swag. Basically the idea is it's trade even or trade up. So whatever you put in is supposed to have equal or more value of what you're taking out. Um, I don't really deal with it because it's normally dollar store kid toys, kind of stuff like that. <clears throat> Regular size is going to be a little bit bigger. Um, ammo cans are popular for this. Um, and then large is going to be the biggest size. There's very few larges out there because they're just going to be gigantic, like gallon milk jugs or uh, like the big paint cans you can buy, five gallon paint cans. Yep. Trash can they have for a large? How full is it? That is a lot of stuff to put in. And then others is going to be anything that doesn't conform to the other four sizes. So I mean, nanos or anything else you can think of. I mean, I've seen people take two Gatorade bottle lids, cut them off, uh, epoxy them together, and it's basically a lid on each side. All it has inside is a, na or a log, and they fish wire it to a bush, a tree, somewhere to hide it. Difficulty in terrain ratings, uh, there's each, each cache has these difficulty in terrain ratings. They range from one to five, and they, have, they break down into halves. Um, so difficulty, the higher the difficulty means it's gonna be harder to find. Um, might need to think about it more. It might not be in the obvious place. Um, not a real good way to explain, I mean, what makes it difficult, it's perception, really. Uh, terrain. Uh, higher terrain is basically going to be a more risky walking environment, uh, underwater, um, in a tree. I climbed 30 foot up a tree for one cache once. Um, interesting. 
So it, it's, it, that's going to be the basis of, I mean, what you want to go find. You'd be looking at these ratings. Definitely kid-friendly. You're going to want to stay away from the higher end. Um, I mean, unless you want to risk them. But I guess that's personal call. I don't have any kids, so I don't worry about it. Uh, geocaching apps. So I use Android. That's what I know the most about. Uh, I use CGEO because it's free. And it's really the best app out there for geocaching on any environment. Um, it's made by a guy who lives somewhere overseas, hell-bent on making a free geocaching app and not working with and potentially even violating the TOS of geocaching.com. He says he doesn't. They say they do. I think they've reached mutual agreement of they're not just going to screw with each other at this point. Um, but he, he owns the GroundSpeak app, and it, there's no touching it. Um, GroundSpeak is the parent company of geocaching. They make their own app. It's 10 bucks for life. Um, free updates for that. It's from what I've heard. I've, I haven't tried it out, um, but most people who go to that end up switching over to CGO because I mean it is free and it is better. Um, he's he puts out updates and new features almost once a week. For the iPhone, the only one I really know of for the iPhone is the GroundSpeak app. Uh, again, 10 bucks. It's the exact same app as on Android. BlackBerry, I don't have BlackBerry. I don't have no clue on what they have, if they even have anything, which they might not. All right, so geocaching is a free membership. Uh, it gets you access to all the uh, caches out there that are not set up as a premium cache. Uh, when, when someone puts out a cache, they have the option to find, is this premium members only, or is it available for everybody? There's millions out there that are just available for anybody. So. Uh, premium membership is kind of an upgrade membership, 30 bucks yearly. Um, I myself am a premium member just for some of the benefits it offers, specifically automated notifications. Um, depending on how you geocache, there's a thing called first defines that people kind of hold some value to. And basically when a cache comes out local to you, they'll race out 24 hours a day to find it and be the first to find of this cache. Whatever you think, uh, I mean, if that suits you, go for it. If not, go to sleep. Um, but automated notifications gets that done. Uh, it sends just basically an email based on a certain config of how many miles around your home location. You provide the email address. I, have, I set mine up actually to send me a text so I know. Um, pocket queries, they're just basically database searches. They give you a bunch of different uh, selection criteria, check boxes, radio buttons, and you pick what you want to see in a pocket query. And it basically pulls back the result set. And then from there, you can either uh, save a GPX file or a loc file and upload it to a, your GPS. Uh, CGO supports it, so you can upload it to your Android phone. And it would just give you that criteria of what you want to go see. Say you just want to find traditional caches you haven't found yet, you don't own and they're within a 10 mile radius of your home. And it'll, it'll download all that to you um, for on the fly. Member only caches, these are the premium member only caches. They're no real different than any traditional caches um, outside of they're just restricted by the cache owner. Favorites, uh, this allows you to go in and mark a cache that you really liked as a favorite. Um, it, I don't see the point in it, but lists, uh, nice feature. Uh, there's quite a few um, puzzles out there or challenges out there that require you to basically maintain a list of caches you found to qualify for it. So, I mean, you can do it not being a premium member. You just got to write it down and remember it <coughs> for when you go log this cache. Um, what I completed recently was five um, level five caches. So, it's either a difficulty five or a terrain five, which are going to be the hardest. You have to get five of those in one month. Um, last month, a friend and I went down to Indiana. We got uh, six of those type of caches in two and a half hours. So that was one. I made a list for it, sent the list to the cache owner, which gave me the ability to log this uh, challenge cache. And lastly, stats. Uh, recently, geocaching.com bought a company called mygeocachingprofile.com. And they're now integrating this uh, stats based on what you've logged um, on your, your public profile. 
So it just shows different stats, like uh, how many caches per day on average, and things like that. All right, so this is the Nauticon 8 cache. No one's found this yet. It currently exists somewhere around this hotel. Coordinates are up top. They're going to be moving, but they're there right now. Um, it's going to be moving eh, probably about 600 feet away from there. I have the new coordinates, but not here yet. Uh, it is a micro. Actually, I can tell you it looks like this because it is a duplicate to this one. Uh, it's just listed as a difficulty terrain of 1.5, 1.5, just a basic, uh, if you're not very hard to find. Um, obviously, if it's a key holder, it, it's magnetic. That helps. It should be fairly easy. Find some metal. It's not that one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and if you do have the geo, any uh, CGO or the geocaching app, you can use, this is the uh, unique identifier, GC code. Um, that will be a, a search criteria uh, within the applications, allow you to find all the information, especially if you're doing it from your phones. Um, I like using phones better because I don't have to download any GPX or LOC files and upload them to my GPSR. I just do it on the fly with my phone, move on from there. Then I always have the latest updates in case anything happens. Are we doing on time here? Certainly. So, anybody have any questions before we move up to case? So I'm sure I'm still good on time. I know there's, uh, being from Kalamazoo, I know there's one in South Haven, Michigan. It's actually outside of legitimate diving areas to where you almost need to be a master diver to get to. It's 40 feet out in some boat wreckage. <laughs> yes? <laughs> Interesting. One minute, okay. I can deal with one minute. Any other questions? Yep. I'm not aware of the orienteering courses. Oh. I could not compare. The orienteering courses are where we did like in Boy Scouts where you get a list of uh, degrees and uh, latitude or uh, compass or uh, settings. Mm -hmm. You go around, you have to find these flags, and the flags all have stamps on them. You have to go from one to one and kind of find them all. It would be a whole hell of a lot easier. I mean, when just on my phone, if I look up a cache on here, I can throw the cache into a Google map. And I mean, from there, I can hook up navigation to it, and it'll get me closest drive time. And then once I'm there, I can, it, I mean, uh, there's a compass as well as um, radar apps. And I mean, you just hold your phone out and follow the arrow. It does everything for you. There's, yeah, there's absolutely no real knowledge of latitude, longitude needed. <laughs> yes, it is easy. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I mean, that's where it started. Um, I know of, in Kalamazoo, there's a, it's called the Al Sabo Nature Preserve. It's several hundred acres of preserve. I mean, you could spend several days in there trying to find, there's, I think there's 25-ish in there. I mean, it's, that's one, um, my wife waded out into a swamp to grab one one day. And that was in February. <laughs> So it's, it, I mean, waders are definitely a, a tool to take, as well as like wrenches, screwdrivers, shit like that. <laughs> yes, it's, it's frustrating too. But hopefully they're, most of them are there. And if you don't like geocaching, please don't go steal the shit out from where they're at. <laughs> there are people out there that do that. All right, so that is everything. Thank you all for attending. We're going to go up to case after this. <laughs>